Early man had few clues to the mysteries of the universe, but every night they would be reminded there was much more to the cosmos than just the Earth, Sun, and Moon. Humanity has been interested in the skies above for at least as long as we've had any sort of civilization able to record anything and likely far longer. Even before we invented the telescope, we had a sophisticated and detailed knowledge of the motion of the stars. Of course we didn't understand the science behind it, but don't confuse that with stupidity on our ancestors' part. They lacked the tools to get more details, and as soon as they had them, their view of the universe changed enormously. Today, as we discuss some options for making truly huge telescopes that might actually let us see planets in far-off solar systems, not just detect the bare essentials of their existence, it probably behooves us to remember that we could end up having as big a swing in our thinking as we had going from astrology to astronomy. We have discovered countless mysteries and surprises in our relatively brief survey of the heavens, and should expect many more. And since that journey of exploration properly began with the invention of the telescope, it's a good place to begin to see how we can make superior ones in the future. The basic concept of a magnifying lens is quite old, and the concept is fairly simple. Light bends when passing into transparent materials like glass, and various geometries with appropriate symmetry will bend that light to the same place, the focal length of that particular lens for light coming in perpendicular to it. By taking a very large area of incoming light and concentrating it into a smaller area, assuming you can keep it even and undistorted, you can let the eye see things normally too dim to make out. This is the very simplest approach but hard to scale up too much, that lens needs to be very high quality and precisely shaped, and you can't realistically go making telescopes kilometers across on a planet. The early versions were typically only a few centimeters across, But it's worth noting that up in the vast emptiness of space, you can make some pretty big lenses, potentially a million times wider than the early ones Galileo used, a mega-telescope. There was quite a variety of designs for those first telescopes of the early 1600s, but they all used the same basic principle, which we call a refracting telescope. A refractor uses not one, but two lenses, the objective lens, which gathers over its entire area and focuses it to a point, and the eyepiece, which makes rays of light parallel again. Of course you also have the tube housing the lenses, which keeps them a fixed distance apart and keeps out light coming from other directions. And while there's a lot of variety of lens types used, the basic design remains quite common and can be made quite large, indeed in 1641, only a generation after the first ones were developed, Johannes Hevelius built one with a 46 meter or 150 foot focal length in Danzig which was in Poland at the time, and it's a good reminder our ancestors weren't hesitant to do big projects. Sadly, the observatory was destroyed by a fire in 1671, though the kings of both Poland and France sent him money to continue his work. Galileo and Kepler rightly get a lot of credit as the fathers of modern astronomy, but it is good to remember there were a lot of other folks working to advance our knowledge at the time, and we already skipped a bunch by jumping to the 1600s. You don't absolutely need the tube on a telescope, at least not for the whole length. In 1675, Christian and Konstantin Huygens built a tubeless 210-foot aerial telescope, and bigger ones soon followed, with Adrian Azu proposing one 1,000 feet long to observe animals on the moon. I always like to point out that intention, since a lot of folks tend to think erroneously that life off Earth was some entirely new idea of strictly modern times. Now you might think these behemoths that you see very distant objects indeed, but in truth they were designed to get around a problem called chromatic aberration. Visible light bends when passing from one medium to another, like from air to glass or glass to water, but different wavelengths or colors bend different amounts and split from each other. The effect is called dispersion, and it's why you get the rainbow effect coming out of a prism. You can reduce this problem by building a long and skinny telescope with lenses of enormous focal length, hence the behemoths. Once Isaac Newton explained that chromatic aberration was caused by dispersion, lensmakers began figuring out how to make achromatic lenses, 
which are not quite accurately named because they reduce the problem, they don't eliminate it. The simplest and still most common achromatic lens consists of two different kinds of glass that focus red and blue light to the same focal length, and the wavelengths in between are only dispersed somewhat. The achromatic lens allowed refracting telescopes to boom once more, and while its invention saw the end of super long monsters, there were some pretty big ones, both in length and more importantly, in aperture diameter up front. That culminated with one 49 inches or 1.25 meters wide in 1900, and a slightly smaller version that is still in service today at York's Observatory and helped pioneer adaptive optics, which we will discuss later. Newton, meanwhile, developed his own approach to solving the chromatic aberration problem, the reflecting telescope. Mirrors reflect all wavelengths of light by the same angle, without dispersion, so reflecting scopes focus light using a curved mirror rather than a lens. The advantage of reflectors is that a large mirror is lighter and, for several reasons, easier to manufacture than a large lens. As astronomers built ever larger scopes, the ubiquitous design was a large parabolic mirror at the back that gathered and reflected the light to a flat mirror that reflected it to an achromatic eyepiece on the side. This is the favorite of hobbyists even nowadays, or at least since the 1960s when John Dobson came up with a particular large, cheap, and easy to build design which is often referred to as a Dobsonian telescope or simply a light bucket. Another invention of the 1600s was Cassegrain's design that also had a mirror at the back, a parabolic one but with a hole in it. The mirror reflects the light coming down the tube back up to a hyperbolic mirror that shoots it back down through a hole in the middle of the real parabolic mirror and into an eyepiece. Remember that parabola though because it will be important in a minute. I don't want to imply that was the end of major improvements to telescopes, indeed we could spend several episodes just on the major ones alone but those basic designs serve as a good refresher as we launch into the ways to supersize them. None of them have actual maximum size limits, in theory anyway. If you had ultra-stiff materials or were operating in zero gravity so that your components don't deform under their own weight, you can go ridiculously large. However, gravity can be handy for one trick. We've often discussed creating artificial gravity by spin, and we've also mentioned that you can increase the apparent gravity on some low gravity place like the Moon by combining its natural gravity with spin, producing gravity at an angle rather than down. If you did this, taking a cylinder and spinning it around on the Moon, then dump some water in it, you could watch as that water formed a parabolic shape at the bottom. If you used a liquid that was highly reflective, like mercury, you would have a big parabolic mirror, which as we mentioned a moment ago is what forms the backside of a Cassegrain style reflecting telescope. By changing the spin rate of that cylinder you could alter the steepness of that parabola, nothing high tech involved in that, just a spinning tube with liquid in it, and it's also dirt cheap. There's one a bit east of Vancouver, the LZT or Large Zenith Telescope, that is amongst our largest optical telescopes and only costs about half a million bucks. Unfortunately, one problem with them is that they can only point straight up, because that mirror is made by gravity plus spin and you can't change gravity's direction, hence the name Zenith Telescope. Another problem is that of course it needs gravity to walk, so you couldn't use it in orbit, but if you could put one someplace like the far side of the Moon, you could have a monstrously big telescope that didn't have Earth's atmosphere in the way and blocked Earth's reflections, emission, and general noise. You could also lower the telescope down into the Moon to protect it when not in use or if you detected incoming meteors. Unlike solid MEO telescopes, a LZT is also somewhat self-healing, provided you don't develop a leak in the container holding the liquid. Small dust particles are going to be smoothed over by the liquid and small pits filled, so in some ways it is also more robust than a standard MEO. We've also talked about O'Neill cylinders and other rotating habitats a lot on this channel, which are just monstrously big tubes when you think about it, and if you built one into the side of a decently massive asteroid or moon, you could make a telescope like this many kilometers wide and long. Indeed you could potentially build pretty large ones on icy dwarf planets like Pluto or floating around in the upper atmosphere of places like Venus. But we can be tricky and clever. Just because spinning something creates apparent gravity in one direction doesn't mean you can't spin it some more. 
If you take a spinning tube or bucket and attach it to a long tether, you can spin it around on that tether and create a second spin gravity force perpendicular to the first, like gravity was. Now you can point it in any direction you please, though only briefly as it's spinning, and your size is limited by how strong that cable or cables are, but you can move it around to any direction you like. There's a couple other geometries for this, and we could also potentially use magnetics, rather than gravity, to create that shape, and since it doesn't rely on natural gravity, you can put it anywhere, like in orbit or way out in deep space. Speaking of orbiting space telescopes, if you're wondering, Hubble is a reflecting telescope with a 2.4 meter mirror, named for Edwin Hubble who helped pioneer the notion of an expanding universe. Its big advantage is that being up in space, it doesn't have to contend with atmospheric interference. There are dozens of ground telescopes with larger mirrors, including the liquid LZT we just discussed at 6 meters diameter. The largest single or monolithic mirror is the Subaru, Japan's 8.3 meter Leviathan in Hawaii, that's held the record for 20 years now. If you're curious, Subaru is the Japanese name of the star cluster many of us know as the Pleiades, and also means Unite. Folks tend to ask if the better known car company sponsored it, or assume it's pronounced differently. It's not actually the biggest reflector, and wasn't when it was made, just the biggest with a single mirror. As I mentioned, we have continued improving telescopes beyond the basic design from the 16 and 1700s. There's two terms you've probably heard that are important to discuss, adaptive optics and active optics. Active optics is an alternative approach to mirrors. In the past we tended to make them rather thick to help cut down on deformation of the mirror from its own weight or wind. However, we eventually realized we could use a thin mirror supported by actuators instead, ones able to push a little here or there under control of a computer to keep the mirror in the right shape against sagging, wind, thermal expansion, and so on. Adaptive optics is an improvement on this that allows us to manipulate the mirror quickly and cause deformations to counter atmospheric distortion. The air in the atmosphere is really no different than glass or water, it bends light too, but it bends it depending on how dense it is or how much moisture is present, and air turbulence can make that rapidly change, indeed that's what makes the stars twinkle. Needless to say, you need a lot of computers to do this well, so it's a fairly recent thing. We should probably take some time to discuss astronomy in wavelengths besides the visual range and interferometry, but we're going to mostly bypass that today. Some things are invisible to normal light or act differently in other wavelengths, but the basic physics for the telescope remains the same. Unlike mirrors and lenses that everyone is already familiar with, and thus easy to explain how it's used in astronomy, interferometry would probably need its own video to do it justice. Short form, waves can interfere with each other, and two identical but out of phase ones can cancel out. If they're not quite identical, you can see the difference when everything identical has been removed. For radio astronomy, we can use this to take two antennas and merge their signals together to look at a specific point. We often see arrays of radio dishes rather than a single big one, and this comes down to resolution. You take a pair of radio dishes separated from each other and each still gathers the same amount of light or radio waves, but the resolution improves. This is the key of astronomy trying to brighten an object so you can see it by squeezing a wide cross-section of light down to a small one, and enhancing resolution so you can make out details of a distant object so it isn't fuzzy or drowned out by noise of other sources off at different angles. So one radio dish has less resolution than two, two has less than three, and so on, especially if they are spaced apart. Normally the resolution of a telescope is controlled by the lens diameter divided by the wavelength, That's fine for an optical telescope because even a lens half a dozen centimeters across, like you'd pick up at a store, is a hundred thousand times larger than the wavelength being observed. But radio waves have wavelengths of meters or even kilometers, so while a lens as big as your hand allows potential resolution of visual light of an arc second, if you want the same resolution for radio waves in the AM radio band, tens of meters in wavelength rather than hundreds of nanometers, you'd need a lens a hundred million times wider, or in fact bigger than our planet. Indeed the AM band is also known as the medium frequency band, 
and the extreme low frequency band has radio waves whose wavelength alone is already bigger than a planet. Incidentally, that doesn't mean you can't see anything with a smaller dish, it just wouldn't have any resolution, like a computer model showing all the same color, 1p instead of 1080p. You can still tell color or wavelength and how bright it is. However, if you want any resolution, you need that bigger lens, and we can fake that by using two dishes that are spread apart but looking at the same thing, and combining the signals we receive. Doesn't gather much more light, just double, but does give you that resolution. Needless to say that recombination is rather precise and tricky and why two dishes aren't just placed on opposite sides of the planet. But we've been getting much better at precision and calculation as years go by, and in this way we can create a fake giant lens or aperture for the purpose of resolution, a synthetic aperture. One of the most important innovations over the past few decades has been the use of interferometry in astronomy, this gives us that desired resolution. Now, it is not only used in traditional radio telescopes, but also in gravitational wave detection too. This is something that we were only recently able to get right with LIGO, an acronym for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. I'll spend a bit of time on this explaining this technology as it is recent and will probably tell us a lot more about our universe as sensitivity and gravitational wave events get detected. It's also a good reminder that astronomy is not only extended to areas of the electromagnetic spectrum beyond the visible range, but can also include gravity. As we'll see, a LIGO is going to be one of the first true mega telescopes in the next 20 years. We started to detect gravitational waves in 2016 and up until now, we have six confirmed gravitational wave detection events. The most recent of these was the August 17, 2017 detection of a collision of two neutron stars, which was neatly simultaneously detected by optical signals by conventional telescopes. LIGO makes use of two 4km vacuum tubes set at right angles to each other. Now, 4km is a much bigger distance than the diameter of any telescope mirror that we have made, but it doesn't act in the same way. A laser beam is split off and reflected off a mirror at the end of the vacuum tube and detected again at the source. The resolution of this telescope is such that it can detect a distance change between the two 4km corridors of less than a ten thousandth the charge diameter of a proton. This is the equivalent of measuring the distance from Earth to Proxima Centauri with an accuracy smaller than the width of a human hail, very impressive. So how does it get this kind of accuracy? The answer lies in interferometry. Light is a wave with peaks and valleys. The LIGO is designed so that the paths are tuned so the returned light is exactly inverse for each path, so if one light beam from the one tube arrives at the detector as a peak, the light from the other right angle tube arrives at the same detector as a valley, cancelling each other out in destructive interference. What we read at the detector normally is zero as the waves perfectly cancel each other out. This is the magic of an interferometer, it's designed to detect something that's interesting otherwise we detect nothing. If space is warped by a gravitational wave, one of the vacuum tubes is going to get slightly longer or shorter and this will cause the light waves to move out of sync with one another so destructive interference doesn't happen and the detector detects the light. The more out of sync the waves are, the more light is detected, so that's where our incredible resolution comes from. Now, there's a fair amount of noise in the system, so there are actually two LIGO detectors, one in Hanford, Washington and the other in Livingston, Louisiana. The gravitational wave travels at the speed of light, and the two LIGO observatories are 10 millilight seconds apart. So we can do some interesting astronomy with these in being able to tell the direction from where a signal came from and also eliminate noise by requiring that a signal be detected by both observatories before it is a confirmed signal. Doing gravitational astronomy is challenging at the moment because the noise levels are almost at the same levels as the signals being read. The arms of the LIGO are really very short for the type of detection they are trying to do. If we want to increase the resolution, we need to increase the arm distances. True to my heart, the European Space Agency is going to supersize a LIGO, not on the ground here on Earth, but in space. I mentioned that each arm of the current LIGO observatory is 4 kilometers in length, but how about supersizing each arm to 2.5 million kilometers long? 
that's what they're proposing to launch in 2034 in a project called LISA, or Laser Interferometer Space Antenna, which should give us much better resolution. Radio telescopes also use interferometry to cancel out signals that are the same and can get better resolution as a result too. In much the same way as LIGO, the idea is to detect waves that are actually different and traveling so one telescope picks it up and then another some milliseconds later. Anyway, back to optical telescopes. An arc minute is a sixtieth of a degree and an arc second is a sixtieth of an arc minute, and there are 1,296,000 of them in a circle. The human eye is rather high resolution, but we top out at about an arc minute, not an arc second. Any star seen from Earth is much less wide than an arc second, again you can see it, but only as a single pixel dot of various brightness, not including twinkle caused by atmospheric turbulence. The Sun is about 2000 arc seconds, and still appears as a blob, but that's simply due to sheer brightness. The Moon has the same angular width, and you can make out some features with the naked eye. If we had an Earth-like exoplanet 10 light years away, one about 13,000 kilometers in diameter, and a distance of 95 trillion kilometers, it has an angular diameter of just 28 micro arc seconds. So if you wanted a picture of just 28 by 28 pixels, one micro arc second each, able to see blue and green light enough to make out the existence of continents and oceans, where each pixel is 500 kilometers across, you would need a telescope lens over a hundred kilometers across, and if you wanted to bump that up to a 1080p image, that lens needs to be the size of a continent, and that scales up linear to distance, put it 100 light years away instead of 10, and you need a lens 10 times bigger, that's why I often mention planet-sized telescopes. If you want to be able to watch a planet in another solar system at nice resolutions with a single lens telescope, that's the scale you need to be considering. Needless to say, it's a lot easier to look at one dot of a distant star and see it dim slightly every 365 days, and infer from that dimming that some planet passes between us and it every year, blocking some light, then figure out its size by how much it blocked and how long it blocked that much at the distance a 365 day orbit requires. Also, needless to say, that's why it's handy to be able to enhance resolution by spreading out two telescopes and merging their imaging. You don't get much light this way either, which can be fixed in part by long exposure times, and we have somewhat parallel examples like the Large Binocular Telescope and a lot of the newer telescopes starting with Keck, which began using mirror segments in honeycombs rather than a single large mirror, this being cheaper and easier to control. Taken to an extreme, NASA's been playing around with taking clouds of glitter, millions of little flecks, and manipulate them to an overall shape with lasers. We looked at liquid mirrors earlier, and these are more like a vapor or fog. It's also been suggested that a spherical arrangement of optical telescopes in space, with their position known to an accuracy smaller than the wavelength of light they're observing, which is hundreds of nanometers rather than hundreds of meters like with a radio telescope, could permit something dubbed a hypertelescope, which could potentially directly image features on exoplanets. Now, all the things we've discussed so far could be scaled up a lot in deep space, far from any gravity perturbations or other potential problems. What's more, you can do some pretty precise manufacturing without all the gravity, air vibrations and so on that we have to deal with down here. Telescopes could hypothetically be built of planetary proportions. We also want to keep in mind that while surface area, or aperture size, controls how much light you collect, it's really the distance between elements that helps with resolution and even noise cancellation. Many telescopes spread far apart, looking at the same thing from different angles, can have their data put together and analyzed to produce a very accurate picture. Telescopes bigger than planets are potentially possible in the distant future, but so is spreading them out over interplanetary or even interstellar distances. Such distances also allow unprecedented parallax for calculating distances with high precision. There's really not much limit how big you can go, with two obvious caveats. First, you need a lot of computer power, and second, you obviously can only go so big before it will collapse under its own weight. On that computer power front though, 
It is worth remembering that the whole point of a telescope is to take a wide area of light and crunch it down to a small size that's now bright enough for our eye to see, and retains its original pattern with little distortion. But hypothetically, you could just have a big sheet of tiny light sensitive cells instead of a mirror, each reporting what hit it and letting a computer do the work, fundamentally not really any different than the aperture synthesis done with mini telescopes only scaled way up in number and down in size, or potentially also up in size. In the end, all that really matters is how many photons you can catch and if you can know what angle they came in from. Needless to say, a lot of the options we discussed a month back in Advanced Metamaterials might help with this a lot, including options like a super lens able to pass the diffraction limit. One can easily imagine whole arrays of planet-sized telescopes sheathed in metamaterials with a planet-sized computer running them, which allows you to potentially look at distant worlds in very high resolution. The flip side of the interstellar beacons we discussed a couple weeks back, that lets you transmit messages civilizations could pick up on the other side of the galaxy, telescopes that could pick up normal transmissions that far away. Now you do have a mass limit to building these things, under which they collapse under their own weight, and that raises another example. You've probably heard of gravitational lensing and a black hole is particularly good at this. We've talked about making artificial black holes before, and one could potentially make one large and clear its area of any mass that might cause interference falling in and radiating as it goes. We've even talked about living around these things. Interestingly, with gravitational lensing like this, you don't have a focus point, but a focus line. Now that's maybe not as handy as it sounds, because diameter is the important thing, and a galaxy for instance produces far more lensing than a black hole and is far larger, but thinking of exotic materials for telescopes, it's also worth noting that dark matter, which is far more plentiful than the normal kind, also doesn't interact with anything other than gravity. So in a really high-tech civilization, you could potentially use it for making a lens that operated by bending space-time rather than bending light. Not likely to be practical anytime soon, or maybe ever, but same as we could get away with tubeless telescopes in the old aerial telescopes, or do away with a lens for a mirror or multiple mirrors, or even do away with all of those in favor of light-sensitive cells and a lot of computers, we don't want to get rigidly bound to any conventional notion of a telescope. Don't rule out scenarios down the line like a billion worlds with mini telescopes all feeding their data into a giant Matrioska brain, a computer powered by a whole star, and pumping out a ridiculously accurate high-resolution map of space. Don't rule out learning to manipulate space-time to form a lens made of nothing but warped space-time. We might have problems even detecting something the size of an entire planet in neighboring solar systems these days, but one day, we might be able to image those as well as our satellites can image Earth now. I think we'll close out here. We did have to touch on more math than I usually like to put in an episode for discussion, but much of it was supplementary, so you could see how we derived these values rather than me just saying them. We also skipped all sorts of tricks we've learned over the last few centuries, both in terms of the technical side of making telescopes and squeezing more data out of them and using that to paint a picture of the galaxy and what it is made up of. Telescopes just let us gather data, figuring out what it means is a whole different story. If you'd like to learn more about that, I'd suggest the astronomy course at brilliant.org. That course walks through practical exercises on everything from the atomic spectra we use to determine what the stars were made of and derive their energy from, to the exoplanets orbiting them and how we detect them. It offers a very hands-on, active learning approach and will introduce you to many of the terms and concepts we see in astronomy that are often left fairly vague in a lot of articles and discussions of these topics. Effective learning is active, that's one of their eight principles of learning. Another of their principles that I strongly agree with is effective learning sparks questions. I not only answer a lot of questions here but also encourage folks to think of whole new ones that follow from the material and I try to give you some of the tools to find answers on your own too. Brilliant's a great place to expand your toolbox, both to help you answer many of the questions you have and help you know what to ask. 
So if you'd like to improve your understanding of math and science, and help support the channel while you're at it, go to brilliant.org slash Isaac Arthur and sign up for free. And also, the first 200 people that go to that link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription. Okay, next week we'll be continuing our look at futuristic conflicts we began with space warfare and looking more at the planetary side of things in Planetary Invasions and reviewing our Book of the Month, Robert Heinlein's Starship Troopers. The week after that it's back to post-scarcity civilizations for a look not just at virtual reality but how people living in such civilizations might have their basic perception of reality altered. For lots when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button and share it with others. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.